Question six. Okay, let's let, let, let's get stuff done. <laughs> um, so thank you for uh, for all being the faithful and keeping me awake on a rainy day not too far from Thanksgiving. Um, what I actually have up here is the um, reading list from the graduate class. And you go to my website, obviously, you can negotiate, you know, negotiate your way over to that. If you like this kind of stuff, it wouldn't be bad. Go in there, find some stuff, click through. You probably can read easily the introductions. And then you probably actually on the empirical stuff could read the, the setup a little bit. And then it'll be generated into things that you needed more classes. And then you can probably read the conclusions. But at least you can see what we do for a living. Um, and if it turns out you're not a proper lab rat and you don't really want to do you know, molecular biology after you turn into a junior, um, then we're a great place to come to. We'd love to have you. You have all the right skills for us. And uh, you know, we don't have any labs. <laughs> on the other hand, if you love your lab, stay with your lab. <laughs> Let's see if I can get this around a bit. What have I got here? Glasses. So we were going to go and oh, we want to go look at our own reading list because we want to look at a problem set, right? The first thing we want to do is we want to go look at a problem set. And so I sort of feel like we've covered the first bunch of these pretty well. And I, I know there may still be questions. We have some time. And you want to go back and work them and come to the front. That's OK. Um, but otherwise, let's, uh, let's leave you with those. Um, we're going down here to to number five, which I had thought of quite a bit before I walked in. So I would suggest the following thought, really is what I said last time. Think of a, a think of an investment that you'd make in plants, equipment, building, et cetera. And if you want to make it really abstract, think of a world in which there's one output we'll call candy bars. And if you invest $100 in candy bar making, that $100 will compound at a 7.5% rate, which is about the rate at which um, the, the rate of interest that the stock market would give you if investing in the market over a long time. So it's not a crazy number. And so you think after 100 years, the amount of candy bars available would go up at you know, the rate of 1.07 to the 100th power. So you're going to walk a lot of candy bars out of it. But if that's what you did with your $100, you think of it as $100 in. Um, right, so I got to put in $100, and after 100 years, it's going to produce candy bars at the rate per year that is 100 times 1.07 roughly to the 100th. And you don't like these two numbers being the same. Uh, we'll go for 90 years. Just to not have the same number twice. Okay, so I invest in the candy bar factory, and my investment in the candy bar factory pays out seven and a half percent a year in terms of candy bars. So after hundred years, it's a huge number of candy bars. But if I invest in the candy bar factory, climate change goes on as it would otherwise, and there are giant tsunamis which wipe out fifteen percent of the candy bars. So I really only get 0.85 times hundred times one point zero seven. Right. The alternative is I invest my hundred dollars in climate change. Yeah. And so suppose I do that. Well, all I'm going to change here is the 0.85, yeah, because of the climate change does. And so the question is, how much money do I get out at the end? Well, I've given up getting my $100 times 1.07 right to the to the 90th. Now I only have what I had to begin with, which is $1. And the 0.85, what's the best it can do? It can go to 1, no damage. So I've created an example here where investing in preventing climate change doesn't work. You're better off to accept the climate change. Yeah, So that's, that's a bald example. You can think of lots of things wrong with it. They can turn it into an interest rate example by asking the question just a little bit differently. And the way they ask it is, is, is a bit strange. So what they would ask is, if I looked at the cost of climate change in 100 years, what would it be? And they give you an answer like you know, $15 trillion. And they'd ask, how much is that worth today? Well, then you divide $15 trillion by 1.07. Oh, we're going for 90 years, to the 90th. And someone could do that. It's a big number, I assure you. And that would give you some number of dollars today. Yeah. That's the amount of money you would pay today to avoid the climate change. It's obviously hugely sensitive to whether I choose 1.07 or 1.02. So to finish out the example this way, first, does anyone know what 1.07 to the 90th is? Anyone got a computer handy? Go find the right number for me, will you? Find 15 trillion divided by 1.07 to the 90th. It'd be better you do that than I make my own estimate. <laughs> yeah. If I invest $100, then I'll have this big amount of candy bar money or GDP. But if I invest in the climate change, in this example, right? I haven't invested in the, I've taken my $100, instead of invested in making candy bars, I've invested in stopping climate change. What's the best I could possibly do? Stop it completely. In which case, 0.85 is no longer 0.85, it's 1. But I haven't invested the $100, right? Yeah, and so I'm going to lose because I now have $1 invested in the candy industry or something, and there's just no way for me to win in this case. Right? So with a very high rate of interest, where working, you know, taking care of climate change or taking care of building plant and equipment are completely interchangeable. That's what I created. Then your investment in climate change has to return as much as your investment in, in the other. You know, 100% of output would be available, except there's climate change, and giant tornadoes kill off 15% of all output. Okay? A little crazy, but that's more or less where we tell the story. You got a number for me, anyone? Wait, what do you got? Yeah? Okay, so you got 34 billion. Now you can do a simple cost benefit analysis. In today's money, preventing climate change is worth $34 billion. How much will it cost to prevent climate change? If the number, imagine you could spend it all today. 
If the number is greater than $34 billion, then the costs, the amount you have to spend today, are more than the benefits, which are $34 billion. You shouldn't do it. Okay. And you can make this more sophisticated, but that's all that's going on in an integrated assessment model. You're comparing the cost of preventing climate change today to the benefits today, and that roughly is the right benefit number today with 1.07. And so let's go through the, the whole way in which you, you talk about it. You say, look, so I could invest in one thing or another. I could invest in, we we'll use the real numbers, I could invest $34 billion into preventing climate change. And that would be exactly a break even. My GDP would not go down by $15 trillion in 100 years, 90 years. Yeah? I have an alternative, the opportunity cost. What was the next best thing I could do? That's the opportunity cost. You're thinking of something you could do. You're thinking, if I didn't do that with my money, what's the, the next best thing? What will I get for that? It's the opportunity cost. Yeah? So if instead I invested $34 billion today in um, plant and equipment to make all kinds of stuff, yeah? what would my investment be worth? Well, we proxy that by saying if we invested in the stock market and left it there for 90 years, how much money would I have? And you know because the example's rigged, I would have exactly $15 trillion. Because right? I rigged the example, I used the interest rate that's appropriate to the stock market. If you want an argument to save the planet, and these are your numbers, then you better find a way to make that not 1.07 or that not $15 trillion. Okay? If, this were, if you had an argument for why you should discount the future at some number way less than 1.07, then this number here, $34 billion, will blow up. And you're better off investing in the uh, you know, in the climate change alternative. So when you read the literature and somebody says, gives you an argument and says, because of that, we should discount the climate change damages at only 2%, you need to go work your numbers. I assure you, it blows this up to a very large number. It makes it worth today putting in the money. That's one possibility. The other possibility is you don't believe that it's on the order of 15 trillion, which is some percent of what GDP in those days would be, approximately the GDP of the United States today. Yep. And that would also get you the answer. So the interest rate you use here is really important. And the question is, why would you, why might you use a lower discount rate um, and I'm not a good person to ask that, because I would say, no, you shouldn't. I'd give you all kinds of other examples, reasons to save the planet. But you would get that answer. The easiest way to get that answer is if you believe too little is invested. Right? If you believe too little is invested today, we are leaving an insufficient amount of stuff to the next generation. Then you'd want more projects that leave stuff to the next generation. All stuff, by the way, not just better climate. So if you had an argument that said, we have whatever interest rates we have today, it has something to do with supply and something to do with demand and something to do with government policy, and it results in our leaving our children, not just you, a dilapidated road system and an unlivable planet, where I got a good road system when I was your age and a livable planet. And so I am leaving too much to the, to the next, too little to the next generation. Then I want to do more projects like save the planet, uh, fix the rail bridge that connects New York City to New Jersey, um, over the Passaic River, I mean, all these prosaic stuff, all of them, by the way, not just fix the planet. And how would I do that? Well, then when I thought of public projects, instead of saying they have to earn the same as these private projects or we won't do them, I would say, no, I'm leaving too little stuff to the future. One way to leave more stuff to the future would be to do more public projects. Public projects will look better. In other words, I'm more likely to do them if I discount the future away. That's the best I can tell the story. Does that make sense? So there's a market failure. I left you too little stuff. That's the failure. And now I'm going and running around and trying to fix it. The way I fix it is by using a low discount rate for public projects. It's a perfect fix, but better than nothing. That, that's my best understanding. Yeah. You're welcome to have a different understanding. <laughs> so I've given you some arguments for a lower discount rate. And E, here, I leave to you. I think of many things to say. Anything that you can say that is reasonable is what is wanted. I do not have a pat answer. You want my answer? My answer is that the planet fire is a very risky venture with essentially unlimited damages. Because there is a substantial chance of nine degrees centigrade, which is unlimited damages. So given that, I want to buy insurance against the planet fire. And I'm willing to pay a lot of extra money to insure myself against a nine degree outcome. That's my answer. You can give a different answer. So we know enough to do five? Okay. What do we ask for six? Six actually re comes from work I did. And if you look in the graduate reading list, you can in fact find the article. Um, so they ask, what's the annual cost of the interest rate? You obviously have to do a discounting problem that you can do. Uh, right, 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 right. Cost problem is 600 million. 600 is the present value of an annual stream of cost. What's the annual cost? If I put in 600 million and I am uh, going to get interest on it forever at 10%, how much money do I get? I'll leave that to you. Um, what's the opportunity cost of the park in terms of the use of land? Right, what would you do with it if it were in the park? How much would that be worth? I think it tells you. Um, what would you do with it if it weren't a park? I think you find out in the first paragraph. What would they have done with it? They would have cut it down. Yes, turned it into fence posts. Um, and how much would the timber companies have to? Uh, how much did the timber companies think it was worth? Six hundred million. Right? There's nothing there. Um, why do you want things annually? Well, you always have a problem. You have an amount of money paid at the beginning of time. In this case, six hundred million, and you have a flow of benefits, visitors that happen every year for a very long time, and you want to make the two comparable. So you get two possibilities. You can take the visitors, find out their value each year, find out the present value of all of their years. That works. Or you go backwards. You can say, okay, so how much money do I have to spend each year because I borrowed 600 million bucks, 60 million dollars? And since the problem is the same year to year to year, as I stated it, you can ask for each year, are the visitor days worth more than the 60 million bucks? And you lost. So you take a two minute. All right? There's nothing, uh, nothing else there. E again, you want to give an answer to E? What, is there some other reason to establish this chart? 
Okay, and why? What, why does existence have value? Oh, oh, okay. So existence value, you're not going to visit it, and you still like it. She's, she's thinking about it for a while. I don't think you really do that. <laughs> but no, I have a feeling you actually probably go visit. <laughs> yeah, okay. That would be an, that'd be an answer, a very economic answer. But there's a lot of biologists and stuff out here, right? Environmental science types? Why do you want to save this thing? Not cute an economics answer, a real answer? <laughs> well, why? Why does it have environmental value? What? Yeah, all right. The last redwood ecosystem in the planet. Well, the whole area up there is, yeah. You know what we actually bought? So when we bought it, they had already cut all the trees, except for the trees at the bottom near Redwood Creek. There was no ecosystem. It was a cutover. And the trees near the creek are the giant trees. So the very first thing the United States had to do was it had to go back up onto the hills and riprap them so that they wouldn't erode down and kill the big trees they just bought. So we spent many million more to keep the trees alive. And now you can see it's a true Redwood ecosystem, so the trees sprout. You can't stop them. So once they come back up, it's fine. So now it's all young growth. We bought it in 76, March 27th, I think. Um, and what you see today is all the growth since then, and only the very bottom of the creek. So actually, the, the values thought of as environmental values we bought it were pretty, pretty small. <laughs> so it's a curiosity. And the largest redwood tree is where? It's not there. The measured ones that are bigger elsewhere. They won't tell you which ones they do, because they're afraid you'll go and sample it. <laughs> all right, so are we OK? We can, we can do our problem set? All right, since we can do our problem set, then we can go back and play with some slides. So we did all this, correct? We got to the end of that. I'm, I'm, I don't know. Oh. You know, some days you just don't do things very well. So now I have to go find glasses and, and, and go find this thing again. I'm just looking at it on my desktop. And, well, maybe we have it. That's the next graduate lecture. Um, let, let's. So we've done some interest rates. We've gone through to here, right? We've done the, the energy saving examples. And I've decided I'm not going to bust most of that. Um, and this is more or less what I've spoken about this morning. Uh, social discount rate, pure, I believe all people are too present-oriented. I want my government to compensate for it. That is, I want them to build more stuff than they would build at the market discount rate. I don't leave enough stuff to you. Okay. So let's talk a bit about benefit-cost analysis. Why do we care? We care because this sentence, if the benefits to whomsoever they may accrue are in excess of the estimated costs, got enshrined in American law, uh, in the 1930s, if I recall correctly, and existed in British usage since about 1900. It becomes a test for a public project. So if you propose a dam, and being environmentalists, I guess you're mostly against dams. Big dam, how many people are in favor? Three, just like I told you. Um, <laughs> if it's in 1930 something and I said that, what would the response have been? And, and it would have been that because hydroelectric power, irrigation, persistent poverty in the United States, and this would be, you'd be left wing, you would have voted for Roosevelt, and you'd be wanting to build these dams. And now you're left wing and you're voting for somebody else and you don't want to build the dams. <laughs> um, but the test to build a dam or any other project is you have to show, you create a document, you give it to OMB, Office of Management Budget, and you have to show that the benefits exceed the costs. So it becomes a very powerful way to debate whether or not a project should be built, particularly a new large government project. And if you can find flaws in their document, sometimes outlandishly so, you do stand a chance of changing the debate and actually uh, getting a more rational outcome. Um, so it is an important piece. The story of Pelico Dam. So Little Tennessee River has a number of water projects on it, the last of which is Pelico Dam. And it was not a wonderful idea. It was not like one of these huge dams where you could quickly see there'd be a huge amount of hydropower. Yes, there'd be environmental damage, but you could see there'd be some benefit. This was more a project where you could see there'd be some environmental damage, but it was really unclear what the benefits would be. It was not an obvious project. The dam was mostly built. So almost all the work on the thing was done. Almost all the money was spent. And the, the Endangered Species Act had just been passed. A biologist wandered around in the stream before they closed it, and he found a very small fish called the snail barter. And that fish was not previously known. So since it was an endemic, apparently only to that stream, the Endangered Species Act said that the dam shouldn't be built because you're not allowed to destroy the last of the species. There's a long legislative story as to what happened next, but roughly what happened is the Endangered Species Act was amended to allow the interagency